tonight. We're joined by Carl Thai and Smy. If you guys have not checked him out, Thai and Smy podcast. He's also the producer at Bears Country Podcast. Um, check them out as well. They produce a lot of content. So thank you for joining us tonight, Thai. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure, man. And I just want to kick off the show by um, by just sending out a little apology that, you know, I, I kind of feel like I kind of almost have to say sorry because I feel like I fell off my wagon. I feel like we were very consistent in our opinion. And here we go again. We're on this merry-go-round where we, we just let the hope win. I think I think we both knew deep down inside, Dave, me and you had this team as a 500 football team this year, all, all year. But then they snuck out of this win. They looked good against some bad defenses. They had a bye week. And I think we were just hoping, really hoping that they would be able to come out and change and be different. And, I, I, you know, as bad as it was, I don't think it was much of a shock for me how that game looked. And mm-hmm. it, it's just like, well, here we go again. I, we predicted that as a win. I, I feel bad about that because we should have kind of stuck to our marbles a little bit. I agree. I literally was going in today thinking to myself, uh, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed at how much I drank the Kool-Aid early on. We pride ourselves on just being like unwavering and not positive just for the sake of being positive. And I think we drank the Kool-Aid a little hard. There's some positives to take out of this, uh, but I have three pages of notes of negatives. And they're long-term negatives, they're in-game negatives, and I'm ready to go. Carl, I was on on your channel, on your show. We did a good two hours about just uh, talking about my football philosophy and my football expectations. And, you know, I, I told you, I want to win by design. I don't want to win by getting lucky. And that, in my opinion, is a perfect example of, you know, almost sneaking out a win because you're getting lucky. And and it's like this inflated win that makes you think you're better than you are when you're not, you know, because you got lucky. Yeah, domination by design is my key. And that was exactly the opposite of what we saw. I'll be your guys' punching bag, and I'll, I'll try and be Mr. Optimism. You're going to have to be because you – because you, you you know you uh you ghosted us like two weeks ago, so yeah, this is what we're right. gonna put you through. That was by design. <laughs> I'm talking about by design. That was by design. Um, I I predicted, regardless of little Jaden or Marcus Mariota, I predicted a very easy Bears win, and I got it half right. I said that the Bears defense would stifle little Jaden, whoever it was, and they did. They held the Commanders to twelve legitimate points. Right? They obviously gave up eighteen at the end, but some of the other numbers that the Commanders have scored throughout the season. 20, 21, and then up to 38, 42, 34, 30, 40, or 23, 40. Um, 12 is a lot less. So the Bears went into Washington. They shut that shit down, so to speak, and they did a great job, in my opinion. The other glass half empty is Caleb Williams, in my opinion. That offense did not look good against a team on paper who, whose defense is really bad. I think that Dan Quinn's a good head coach, a good defensive coordinator. But their offense did not look good last night i think that the bears th- this is not a terrible showing like a lot of people are trying to make it up i know it's monday a little bit overreaction but i'll let you guys talk yeah david we've talked in the past about this team being arrogant to an extent and the, the staff being arrogant and you know one of the things i go back on is playing checkers before you start to play chess i always said you know yurko from espn said when i'm on the line of scrimmage and I'm playing against an offensive lineman, it starts with the physical part. It starts with checkers. If I could just manhandle you and toss you around, we don't get to the hand fighting and the – you don't get to playing chess. You got to be able to play checkers first. And here we are, 12 to – what was it, 12 to 7 in the mm-hmm. fourth quarter, six minutes left, and we're going to hand the ball off to a guy who's got his thumbs taped was it is an asinine choice? Absolutely. It deserves a public apology and anything else, anything less. I'm going to be very disappointed in. Yeah. Yes. You, you want so, to dominate, you want to dominate there just physically, just give it, give it to your running back. And you know what? The next time they're at the goal line, that's what they did. And they scored. I, I, we can go into there right away. If you want to start there, I had some positives ready to go, but on the Doug Kramer thing, there's a few parts to that. And that's why one of, one of my negatives, like it's, you talk about arrogance, you talk about stupidity, you talk about lack of game management capabilities. Doug Kramer was playing t- snaps at left guard yesterday by the time he got that snap. Because so you're, he had not to only due that, to injury. That's fine. But at that point, that play leaves your playbook. You cannot sacrifice 
your left guard at that point, your starting left guard with a gimmicky, sweet, little, adorable mm-hmm. uh, fullback dive. You're not Andy Reid. You don't you Here's, don't earn the benefit of the doubt to get all cute guys in the fourth quarter like that. Like that's yeah, he treated probably, it like a Disney movie. There's no excuse. It, it's not a Disney movie, it's a football guys, game. You 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 want to run fullback dives. Do you want to know how many carries your actual fullback had up until this point in week eight? Kari Blazing game, who was your actual starting fullback until three days ago, who got benched? Zero. Kari Blazing game. I have zero on my season totals. I don't know where you saw two. I have zero. Cut. He he he's cut. Oh, he he's was not cut. On the roster. Yeah. But that's the point. Not benched. Is, cut. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So he was well. He was injured for periods of time. Healthy scratch for periods of time. Mystery injuries that I call as you know, basically just keeping a guy on the roster and not keeping him employed while simultaneously, you know what I mean. That's that's what the Kari Blazing game injury was. It was a way to keep him employed, keep him on the roster until you had to cut him. Now he's a cut casualty due to IR returns. How many times have you run a fullback dive this actual season? Zero. And in crunch time against the best team you've played all season down 12 to seven, you are so clever that you want to throw it to, you want to give it to Doug Kramer. Your guy is Doug Kramer. Like, what are we doing here? It's it's what we're talking about though, David. But the checkers and chess thing analogy is absolutely correct. And we agree on this. It's beyond that. It's so much worse than that. We're going to cut our fullback and then we're going to use our backup left guard to finally run a full, they'll never expect it. They'll never see it coming. We're, we're going to fake it left. Then we're going to fake it right. Then we're going to think about faking. So, uh, let's go positives. And this is like, honestly, I do want to start at a positive one. That's a genuine, genuine positive. I have z- still zero issue with Caleb Williams, other than the fact that I feel like he's being wasted under this staff. Caleb gets two plays at the line. He's allowed to check to one, check to the other based on the situation or whatever. I know that that's been an ongoing thing this season. And then once that was taken away, that's when the offense started to click. I can't speak to that. Part of the problem with that even though is if you are a any decent offensive coordinator, that needs to be done halfway through the first quarter and not the fourth quarter and then somehow turn that on to blame Caleb Williams for 33 yards through three quarters. If there's no rhythm because the rookie quarterback is underperforming in his rookie year, which he should, and you're a six-year offensive coordinator in the NFL, you should not need three quarters to detect that, to detect what you need to be doing to give that kid a sense of rhythm in the offense. Because I still see when it matters and when he needs to perform, He's doing the things that will win you games in the NFL. The the guy should have won 21 to 12, 21 to, right? Like we're talking about, this is not on Caleb Williams by any stretch of the mean, by any stretch of the imagination. This game is not on him. There's there, there are seven people I can blame in this game before I get to Caleb Williams. And even that's being generous to just kind of say, let's increase his, his, his ranking in the, in the blame game to just kind of say like, Hey, our quarterback didn't perform. C.J. Stroud won plenty of games last year with similar stats. Yeah. If you had an honest conversation with Caleb Williams behind closed doors, off the record, I think that Caleb Williams would told you I needed to play better. Of oh, like, 100%. Outside of but the it, public scope, like g- genuine, he would tell you that. He, oh, he, did he a literally bomb missed it. like a 50-yard touchdown to um, – th- sc- speculation here. It he would have been a big game to Keenan Allen. I still think that he would have told you he should have played better. It's not that he's a bad quarterback, and it's amazing. I'd much rather have the quarterback that rises to the occasion and wins you the game at the end, as opposed to little Jaden who stat pads and has to rely on a, you know, a hail mary to win a football game. I'd much rather have Caleb in that sense. But I do think that he could have played better. But he didn't implode. So, so that's not the thing. It's not, it's not, not like no. he threw like three or four picks or like a pick six or two. He didn't go out there and just completely shit the bed. He didn't play well enough, of course. He could have played better, definitely, 100%. But he didn't go out there and just completely cost you the game. And and so I think that's where that quarterback growth conversation comes into play. Like, you're going to have these hiccups. And I guess it's a positive that he didn't completely fall apart. As one of my favorite YouTube and internet followers, Ben Solak, is one of my favorite things he says is, progression is never linear, guys. It will never just go up. There's going to be plateaus and a dip and then a huge spike. And guess what? At some point this year against a decent to above average team, Caleb Williams is going to have 400 yards and four touchdowns. 
It is more than likely going to happen. But I didn't see anything in that game that made me think like, this guy sucks. He's never going to be able to throw 400 yards and four touchdowns. There's nothing that I saw in that game. I agree with you. Cold-blooded, 100%. Totally should have played a little better. I don't feel like, I do feel watching him and watching good Caleb Williams games, if I'm being honest, I felt a little bit of watching him play one-handed. I felt like it, whatever that reason is, whether it's his decision-making and he's underprepared after two weeks, which I would still blame on coaching staff at that point with a rookie quarterback, or he is making the wrong calls at the line or given too much power at the line and making those mistakes. That's a natural progression of a rookie quarterback. It's eight games in. The guy's been playing literally seven pro football games, and it's night and day from week one. Although I would say the yesterday's game was probably the closest thing to week one that we've seen so far. So that's my positive. I'm not, I'm just not freaking out about Caleb. I still have full trust. I want him to have a better coordinator and a better coach and really kind of take off in year two. Um, but honestly, and this is going to be kind of one of those like passive aggressive positives. I genuinely mean this. A positive of yesterday is that you lost because if you win that game yesterday, so much of the stink and we said this like before over the summer, like sometimes you just can't tell with this team where the stench is coming from. And that was so bad with Justin Fields because everybody's blaming Justin and the lack of weapons and then the coaching staff and then Luke Getze and then it's really Eberflus, but it's Poles not getting him weapons. And there's just, the Bears are so good at covering where the stink is coming from. And I really do think if they win yesterday, that stink is going to be covered up. Like, what are we talking about today? We're talking about a shitty, gutted out, tough, tough team. Eberflus is a tough, gritty coach who's toughing it out and the defense wins championships and da da da. This game, it's like a throbbing, rotten fish in the middle of the in the middle of the market right now, right? Like it's a perfect scenario to actually find where the stink was coming from finally. And I'm I'm genuinely happy. It, a, a win masks so much of this bullshit, and the loss is going to lead to progress because even if they do make the playoffs, which is super strong possibility, that's one of my third positives is that the season is, season is not over by any stretch. Um, the team looked good as a, as a team kind of can against a first seed. This was, this was literally the playoff matchup. If the playoffs started today, it's the two seed versus the seven seed because the first round, the first seed gets the buy. This is a playoff game. Felt, that's it felt like and that a feels like because of the magnitude of the quarterbacks. The and it ended the like a playoff playing. Game. Yeah. So, it ended like a yeah. playoff game. It was 30 sure. seconds of, of three points, right? It, it, it was good. It was a good game. What you're saying as far as the Bears, you know, you don't want it to be a, a nasty clunker, scrape it out type of game where they earn the win and you kind of want them to face reality. The Chiefs have a lot of wins on their record this year that are exactly like that, too. They've so, earned those. OK, I understand where you're coming from. But once we get down the line and where we get to things are a little bit better, I do think that those types of wins, which we're already seeing, which are going to uh, end up falling on the shoulders of the quarterback, we're already seeing those. And that's a, a direct positive on Caleb Williams. Yeah, but but the, like David said, though, they've earned those. They dominate by design. They'll take every lucky win they can get. They will. And, and they've earned it, right? Whereas our lucky wins would, like I said, give us an inflated sense of hope that this thing's actually good. It's kind of like 2018 where the team went, you know, what, 12 and four. And all we needed was a kicker, right? But <laughs> turns out we weren't all, all that great. But we just went 12 and four. But you know what? You got you got lucky in some of those games, right? And so it wasn't a true depiction of what that team was and where they were actually were at. And so therefore it wasn't handled properly. In real time during the game, I texted David and I said, I'll take this win as a dirty win. And he texts me right back. He goes, no, let him drive down. Let him kick a field goal, go in overtime and keep kicking our ass. He's like, because we don't deserve this win. And time's up for this coaching staff. It's time to face reality and not have this curtain of inflated hope in front of us. And I don't know if you guys saw it. It's disgusting. Matt Eberflus, there's a list of things that he did not take accountability for today and frankly doubled down. And today, Tyreek just absolutely, not only did he not hold accountability, he almost doubled down. He's like, I wasn't talking shit to the Washington fans. I was cheering with some Bears fans. He goes, yeah, it's my job to box out Noah Gray on that play, which he's the guy who initially made that touchdown. And I, I saw on online today the prototypical Hail Mary defense of an NFL team. It was the exact play out of a playbook. And it's the bunch man, the jumper, 
the front man knocked down for the tip, the back man knocked down for the tip. If you notice, there's no knockdown back man because it's Tyreek. And Tyreek goes like, hey man, you know, I made a play for the ball. And you know, if ever if I made it, if I knocked it down, everybody would be saying, hey, great play today, Tyreek. But you know, it didn't go that way. And so, you know, it's, what happens today is what happens today. So he's basically wow. saying like, it was a 50-50 chance. No motherfucker. You didn't do your fucking job and no one's going to hold you accountable to it because that's not what anybody does on this team. No one holds anyone accountable. Mind you, the head coach himself won't hold himself accountable, won't hold his his uh, coaching staff accountable. He won't play call any players accountable. So, of course, that's the stench. That's the attitude. We talk about arrogance, Paulie, about that weird arrogance that somehow this team feels like it's earned, that Matt Eberflus feels like he's earned. I don't know where he gets this from because he hasn't earned any of it. He's 13 and 27 as a head coach. Way too many games, by the way. That list is an insane total of games you're allowed to coach when your record is that fucking shitty. It, it's too big of a number. And then on top of it, he's not going to say anything because what can he say? He didn't call the timeout. Flus continues to put out choke culture. Guys, 2023 versus Denver, we had a 98% chance in the fourth quarter to win. We lost 2023 against Detroit. We had a 98% chance to win in the fourth quarter. We lost 2023 against Cleveland. We had a 91% chance in the fourth quarter to win. We lost. And here we go. 2024 against Washington. We had a 96 and a half percent chance to win. And we lost. And we talked about repeating mistakes. I talked about my concern um, for, losing games in a certain fashion. If you repeat the same things you did in the past, that's not good. And then another comment he said is this isn't the NCAA. You can't bench him for that. Black Bear, uh, I've seen Bill Belichick bench guys for getting a flag. Black Bear, we've literally seen a team in our own division suspend two players in the last two years that are stars for just being a disrespectful teammate, conduct detrimental to their team. That's how you become a fucking powerhouse. That's how the Packers bench Jair Alexander, the star of their defense. That's how they bench Romeo Dobbs for a healthy scratch for having fucking attitude problems. Guess what it did for Romeo Dobbs? He's fucking playing. Why can't the Bears do it? Vernon Davis. Can't win with him. You can't win with him. Remember Mike Singletary? Calling out Vernon Davis? I don't want this guy on my team. What happened? It shaped him up, man. It shaped him up. Something clicked in his head. We're like, damn, I'm going to be held accountable for my actions. This is how you actually establish a culture. My opinion, um, Matt Eberflus not taking accountability and essentially calling out the players and saying it was their fault for the loss. I don't like that, but it it unfortunately is the truth. So if he doesn't handle the Tyreek situation with either benching him saying uh, even if he says you're going to play 50 percent of the snaps we're going to rotate terrell smith in more i think i'd be okay with that but if he just turns a blind eye it's the same thing tyreek plays whatever percentage of snaps he plays that's going to really change my mind on matt eberflus really really quickly what we're saying is the reason he needs to be fired is because he won't bench him which he should do because he doesn't have the job security he doesn't have the confidence he doesn't have the balls or the schematic confidence to do whatever he needs to do to send a message to some fucking players these are players that had a team only meeting or a team meeting with their coaches saying we want to be coached hard this year this is not coaching hard when you let him do this shit you don't call timeouts you let a 15 yard play on on uh on a play before a hail mary that's not coaching hard and then you take no accountability and then you don't bench the guys who fucked it up because you also fucked it up that's that's the definition of why these players are saying we want to be coach hard and why this is why I say this game losing is almost a positive. It puts such an obvious stink in the room that you cannot keep him around next year, regardless of how the season ends, because you're your ceiling. The floor with Matt Eberflus is probably pretty high because he's a good defensive coordinator, but your ceiling is almost you're keeping it right at the same level. Their floor with Matt Eberflus is six wins. Their ceiling is nine. Can you guys see that better? Mm-hmm. So I just want to, for the sake of consistency, say, I mean, October 2nd, 2023, Eberflus deserves to be fired. November 24th, 2023, do the Bears fire Matt Eberflus? Now, it's a little out of order. I think this is our most recent one. Eberflus lacks accountability. What makes Matt Eberflus special? Our answer was, we don't know. Do you trust Matt Eberflus to put together a staff? Is keeping Matt Eberflus a mistake? 
So, guys, this isn't something that we're just pulling out of our ass here. This is something we've been on for a good, good little while that, man, there's a clear upgrade here. And it and the coaching staff, it's so, like David said, arrogant this offseason to not even interview other guys. As if you have this all figured out, you just replace, had to replace your offensive and defensive coordinators. But everything's fine. I even put out a t- uh, poll on our YouTube channel saying who's got the worst coaching staff in the NFC North. Just to make people realize, oh, the thigh, and I love it. You're shaking your head. No, it, it's such it's an obvious us. answer. It's, it's a us. very obvious us. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah oh no, sure. I heard a great comment yesterday. The Bears have probably the sixth best head coach in the NFC North because Brian Flores, Ben Johnson, are also in this in this division. I don't know. the The one thing that you know, you guys just said, what's special about Matt Eberflus? <clears throat> I don't know how many. Four three schemes there are, especially the way that the Bears run. So I would be very scared of the Bears blowing up their fantastic, you know, downright legendary defense because they want to fire the head coach. Not saying know. he's a bad defensive coordinator, but as a head coach, you just have way too much on your plate and, and you're not getting the job done at the end of the day. And then Carl, you know, I know initially we had some back and forth right after the game on Twitter. And, you know, right away I told you I'm blaming the head coach because he's the head coach and it is three years in. Like it, it's time for this to fall on the top domino here. Right. And, you know, I just, I want to say like, let's not pretend like there isn't another coach out there that can get the same production out of the talent that's on the field. Like I always credit and blame the players a lot more than I I do the coaching staff. Like I think a lot of what we're seeing from the defense is because we have good talented players. You went out there and got TJ Edwards, who you knew was a good linebacker. You went out there and got, Tremaine Edmonds. Tremaine, thank mm-hmm. you. Tremaine Edmonds, who, you know, who is a good linebacker. You went out there and got Montez Sweat. But what did this defense look like before Montez Sweat? Was Eber Flus this master defensive coach before that? And no. This is it, where, to Carl's really point, good. to he kind was of. really good go- with Indianapolis. And the players who, they, they gained confidence and experience. I think that the young players played better. Jaquan Brisker, Kyler Gordon. They got better just with experience. So I don't know. I do agree with your point, but I do think that Eberflus's defense shouldn't just be thrown to the wayside. I think it is a very valuable asset, and the Bears need to figure out how to overcome the rest of it. Carl, well, we're I think... throwing it to the wayside right now. What you do you mean? It to the wayside. You're wasting a year with it because he's uh, the one coaching this team. Right. You're wasting a year so... of golden opportunity of this amazing defense because – you are putting a cap, a ceiling on what the team can do this year because you left Matt Eberflus in charge of it. And it while feels I... more like the Bears are going through their rookie quarterback growing pains, and I think unfortunately it's something that was to be expected. And that's and I, it is a bit of a yeah t- double sided coin, double uh, double edged thing. Four three defenses are not they're not three four schemes with five linebackers, some crazy schematic thing where guys drop in and out of coverage. This is a this is not an un impossible defense to figure out and when you ask like how many defenses and good teams are running this this kind of defense it's all the good ones all the good ones can do this consistently when you have that talent the eagles run the similar sets detroit runs similar set buffalo runs similar sets uh not kansas city necessarily but because they just shift their line yeah. so much but that's kansas, this isn't kansas like you city can't the not Vikings find the ones this. That i like their schemes the most they have the six on the line you know essentially they're saying fuck you when they're playing defense and that's what i like but Green Bay runs it. That's but that's because you have when you the two teams you just described have two of the greatest defensive coordinators in the game, and they're guys that de- constantly, consistently decline head coaching jobs because they're happy with being the second or first paid, highest paid defensive coordinator in the league. This coaching cycle is significantly better than last year's, and that's really the one positive that you could say to holding on to Eberflus is you're gonna not miss out. We were on the boat of let's let's be one step ahead here. Let's not waste another year. Let's not have a lame duck here. Let's like, this is obviously going to create a wall for the success you're going to have as a team here. Um, Let's just do it now. Like I was so adamant about, man, let's, let's not be on this merry-go-round that we've been on where we draft a quarterback and one year later, fire the coach. Let's do it all in one shot. Like I would have loved to have done it all this last off season. Draft Caleb get a new coach, get a new, I mean, that's, I think that would have been a lot more beneficial for this team. 
Um, but then they started hot. You know what I mean? So, so it's like, okay, so you back off that a little bit. But here we are. They're just showing who they are again. And and I think the biggest key for me this week is that you had two weeks to prepare. And it felt mm-hmm. exactly like the Titans game. Like, we already got our lucky win this year. And it was in week one, right? And you had all off season to prepare for week one. And here we go. You have two weeks to prepare for this. And you come out looking like that. Like, it's not going to change. I have my worst seven decisions from that one game. And I power ranked them based on what I would feel like you would be fair to saying these are Eberflus, then not so much his fault. Number one, biggest problem he did all game, um, by far, I think. The play before didn't matter. That comment, that insane, you, insane you can, comment. You can call it the final minute. I don't know if that's where you're going, but bo- both things. He doubled down today and he said, look, so, the, the no, play there's before two didn't parts matter. to that. It did. There's two. There's, there's, yes, but there are such huge, egregious problems. When you say the final minute, it doesn't do justice how many, how many catastrophic mistakes. That should have been stopped. Number one is oh. by far more than the Hail Mary because Hail Marys are just fucking bullshit luck and whatever. Not the play before not mattering. Jaden Daniels with a broken rib is not capable of throwing an 85 yard pass. So for you to be such a fucking dumbass, it's so dumb to say that the 15 yards you gave him to actually complete the Hail Mary did not matter is one of the most insane. It's one of the worst. And I saw it's so funny because I was so mad about it before. And then you see ESPN going like, it's one of the dumbest things that's ever been said about pro sports ever. Mike Greenberg said, this is makes his list of top dumbest things a coach has ever said. I think he said anybody in humanity. Rex Ryan went off, went off for like nine, 10 minutes on just talking about that's his job description, but go on. Yes, but just talking about, you know, and I'm not saying that Rex is the best ever, but, like, he went off on just the execution uh, and the game plan for that Hail Mary. Like, you have T.J. Edwards out there spying him. You didn't call a timeout. You do not need a spy on a Hail Mary. You do not need a spy. It doesn't make any fucking sense. Was he going to scramble for 65 yards with a broken rib? Please, please let him try. The play before didn't matter. Polly, you said it to me, too, and I missed it in the moment. Caleb Williams have to having to pull Matt Eberflus off the field to not was get that on the hail mary t- or the play before the play, play before. before play before oh it wasn't Matt the hail mary. Caleb walked Williams onto the field the camera zoomed in on, on on Caleb Williams as he was on the bench and he like looked sideways and was like oh and then like we're gonna get a f- we're gonna play, get a penalty and you see Caleb Williams run out there grab Matt Eberflus and drag him onto the sideline so the situational the quarterback quarterback was on the, the situational mary. awareness no, of your before. rookie quarterback is right. better than your head coach within that play. Eberflus not seeing Tyreek Stevenson and failing to call a timeout why don't you just call a timeout regardless so number two let them line two, up and then just get a better not picture calling and take a timeout, timeout. number yeah, two is not it's calling so a timeout. bad it's so bad. so much more egregious even if the, everybody was set and you just didn't like a little bit of something and you then, can no, still call a timeout the same way on a fucking field goal yeah, just to get, get a snapshot. snapshot. Same way. And then yeah. let's reset. We see what they're going to do. We see where they're going to line up. They can't change it. It's a Hail Mary. There's no miss. Okay. On, two, on like, third, I, the two guys we had out there, personnel change. On a third down, there was a play that was questionable, that was caught. And I know, Thai, you said that, like, oh, that probably would have been complete. Whatever. It was questionable. What did the commanders do? Don't rush, be sorry for that. Don't rush up to the line. <laughs> rush up to the line. Try and get the snap off so it can't even be challenged because even they – knew oh crap it, it 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 might be it might not be it's one of those things so situationally but then he gets the challenge wrong because well, listen, they they called but, it a catch he'd get but, it wrong but, and then you lose the timeout and then but you look at the end result that. you kept all your timeouts you finished the game with all your timeouts good job so like you might have that, needed them there, there was a I point think, well I, I Matt Eberflew said in his press conference he thought you didn't get keep all three you get an extra one next week What's <laughs> no? That's yeah, what Matty maybe he thinks. Th- yeah, it's it's very possible. Yeah, the challenges stack like like my T-Mobile minutes, right? Mm-hmm. Number three, which again, this is why we're talking about one minute here. You're saying, Carl, like you almost were like the last minute was really bad. Look how much we can break down personnel on the hail mary. Can't blame Zach it. Zach Ertz. Zach, what? 
Yes, you Montez can. Montez Sweat has been playing through injury. Him not being it's on the, the field. It's the clutch, buddy. It's the last play of the game. You NFL. just fucking you ice your shit afterwards. I don't well, care. Break a you leg. You only NFL. brought you only bought three and had a spy. So Montez Sweat or anyone else is not getting through. Do you know team. who the other pass fine. rusher was on that play, Carl? It was Jacob Martin and um, Austin Booker, and then whoever Why was the f- playing knows and T.J. No, Edwards. No, Austin Booker. I thought he was. I'm, I must. It be was wrong. Jacob Martin, Demarcus Walker, and Jervon Dexter. That's right. the case, Black Bear. Then fine, respectfully fine. fine. However, even then, you need Austin Booker out there, your fastest defensive end, Austin to catch Booker, up to Jaden Daniels. Just his motor alone. Whether he had one arm, one on leg, a hail he should have been on the field. Austin Booker needs to be out there. Yeah, and um, Darrell Taylor needs to be out there. The two highest motor, quickest defensive ends you can throw out there on a Hail Mary to rush the throw. And this is just common fucking sense. And then you have zero, zero players above the height of six feet tall on that jump ball. At that point, honest to God, and I'm not even kidding this as as like a, a cutesy thing, I have no issue if Roma Dunze or Cole Komet being 6'5 and 6'3 respectfully are out there on that play. Cole Komet, I don't know about that. Roman Dunze, I'm fine with that. Guys who can high point the ball, for sure, Dave. Just, yeah, that's it. Just high it. point it, slap it down, catch it, whatever. The the personnel, and I'm not exaggerating. I looked at the fucking personnel on that play. I saw five easy fixes of personnel on that. If you really have, want Demarcus Walker in there, put him in at nose. Put him in at nose. Austin Booker and Darrell Taylor need to be out there. Rome should have been out there. You're not about D- to- Elijah Hicks. Elijah Hicks is five foot eleven. Tyreek Hill is six foot even. Jalen Johnson is six foot even. Zach Ertz alone is six foot six. It makes no fucking sense. The personnel choices, and that's again, Carl. I'm picking these based on these are purely and exclusively a Matt Eberflus fuck up. So number four, not challenging the catch in the second quarter. I know they rushed up to the line and snapped that ball quickly. Matt Eberflus has been absolutely mental pretzeled into throwing challenges where he, yeah, where he's like, flag. Oh, we're good on challenges. And, and it's like, you're not. Yeah. Well, yeah. So what he was got, that? He got roasted. He said, we're great at it. it. We're great at it. For it. And everybody annihilated him for it. And now since then he hasn't thrown, I think a single challenge flag. Situationally, you, ha- you have to there. It Just was like a third down catch and Terry McLaurin clearly caught it off the turf. It was a huge play in the second quarter. It would have at least eliminated three points off the board. And in a close game like this, forget the Doug Kramer shit. Forget all these points matter. Throw a motherfucking flag. And the same way you said it, Paulie, you don't get bonus points for keeping all your timeouts. Throw it and see what the fuck happens. Uh, Number five, Tyreek Stevenson being matched up at any point on Terry McLaurin. And I said this on the deep ball. You need to shadow... Jalen Johnson on Ty- Terry McLaurin because there is no other receiver on that team. If that's the team your game just play, doesn't run that, and I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I can't it be stand your it. best man on your best man. They just play halves. Just like it the can safeties. be done, and I get that it can be halves and it can be done against certain teams. You can do against Tennessee when Calvin Ridley and DeAndre Hopkins are basically the same guy at this point in their career. You can do it against other teams. You can do it. You can't do it against the Washington Commanders when their only offensive threat is Terry McLaurin. You need to just take it away, shut it down, be flexible. If there's no say, you need to be flexibility in your so, defensive scheme, this is more to support your point, yeah. Carl. You can find any fucking schmuck in the NFL who's a defensive coordinator who runs 4-3 and a modified version of Tampa 2 and fucking cover 2 man. It's not that different. My last two, this is going to be less, I guess, on Matt Eberflus if you want to. Um, I still say this one is huge. Doug Kramer getting the ball is still an Eberflus problem. It still is. He gets the veto rights. He can hear it come through the headset and say, whoa, 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 what the fuck are we doing? What the fuck are we doing? What the fuck are we doing? And he can literally veto that shit on third down in a crunch time fourth quarter with three timeouts, as Paulie has pointed out multiple times at this point. And Matt Eberflus has the ability and the absolute right. And if he did it and had the balls to do it, and said, guys, guys, time out. He'd be the fucking hero today. But he did it. And my final point, fourth and one. This is probably the least on Matt Eberflus. It's a play that just pissed me off. The short side flare screen to DJ Moore on fourth and yeah. one at midfield. It, it pissed me off so fucking badly. It's a fucking flare screen one-on-one oh. to the short side of the field. My thought. The on one that. where he got face masked and nobody said anything. Yep. Correct. Yep. He did and get DJ Moore got up all pissed yep. off and none of the commentators yep. said anything. And that's fine. It. 
And that's I think fine. That was it should have been a face mask. That Offensive line penalties. Like in the, in the win we had against the Jaguars, we didn't have any false starts. We didn't have any holding calls. Um, so that stuck out to me. But go ahead. What do you guys think? Have you guys noticed if the only got worse, better? You or were down still the to same? your second left tackle, but you're now also on your third left guard in Doug Kramer, who's not even your left guard. He's a center. So it, um, it's not I... an excuse. If, if, you, if you're better coached, it doesn't matter if it's your first string, seventh string. If you, if, you, if you put me on the field, I should be well coached enough to at least not get a false start. I obviously will get my ass ran over. But if that's not the coaching, I agree with you on that. There's two points to be made. They about are the getting beat up. They are. They're, they're hurt, which is whatever. It's a besides the point. Injuries happen in the NFL. Injury is not going to be something that I'm going to excuse, but it is a reason, I suppose, why they might be looking a little bit worse. But also, if you recall what Ryan Pohl said about this offensive line this offseason, anybody remember? This is the deepest offensive line we've ever had since I've been here, is Ryan Pohl's comment. So he's going to tell you right now, it doesn't matter because it's the deepest we've ever had. Secondly, the Kieran uh, Amigdaje, I forget. I, oh my, oh my, Daje, I forget how to pronounce it properly. I like to say Omega um, DJ. I like to say, Omega, oh my Omega God, DJ. Jay, Omega yeah, God, Jay. Exactly. Um, when you want, you want to talk about a a player looking so underprepared for a for a time, for a play, for a position. Um, it's one of the worst debuts I've ever seen in that respect. I don't think it's his physical talents. I don't think the guy's going to suck as an NFL player. Um, and this is part of one of my second pages of like long-term side effects from this game. Um, th it's the same shit that when Matt Nagy just threw Jason Peters out there and said, this is my plan. You're going to be one-on-one -on -one with Miles Garrett. And I have nothing to offer you in terms of help. You got your left tackle injured, who's been your four-year left tackle, who say what you want about Braxton Jones. I like the guy a lot. I think he's a up, he's definitely a plus player rather than a negative. He's not great, but he's definitely a, a more of a positive than he is a negative. Serviceable. He's serviceable as hell. Um, they did nothing to help Kieran. They did nothing to change the game plan. It just looked like they were like, hey, you know all of Braxton's plays? You run the exact same shit out there. And you're a rookie and you've never played before. And that's just kind of what you're going to see. Other than that, I mean, Darnell Wright's just disappointing as fuck this year. Um, he's not your, like, staple franchise right tackle. I don't know. This line is not, like, your your sore thumb right now. And then also, where the fuck is Ryan Bates? Tell me about it. I, I was the one in the comments. I, I think I, I frustrated you in the show. I called him the savior, half joking. But I am eagerly anticipating the return of Ryan Bates. I don't oh, know yeah. what he's going to do for David you. David went off on that. I remember that. That was nice. I mean, They're Matt Pryor should have been the um, player to come in at left tackle. Ryan Bates would have been an excellent right guard instead of Nate Davis. I'm going to digress on that point, but I'm, I'm going to take a wait-and-see approach with, with Ryan Bates. I agree with you that an extra body will give you more flexibility in terms of positional stuff because Matt Pryor has played left tackle, left guard, right guard, all that stuff. I get that he's going to give you more flexibility, but it's purely because your buffoonery of not moving on from players that you need to move on long term, long over time. And you have Nate Davis as a healthy fucking scratch two weeks in a row. Braxton Jones was a fifth round value pick that you got four years out of, of like, if we're talking a scale of one to 10 at minimum, I don't care if you're a biggest Braxton Jones hater, he's a six. And at best you can give him an eight. He's never been better than that. He's between the six and eight range from a fifth round pick. That's basically free. You're going to let him walk and, and you, you thank him and you Charles Leno clap for him. Right. And you just let him go somewhere else and be a mediocre starter somewhere else for much more money. But he is a good player. And I, I think he gets way too much hate is all I'm saying with Braxton Jones. Braxton Jones is more than a bandaid. He was more like gauze. Okay. So here's my long, like bigger picture problems that I saw out of this week. And it was more to the point where I don't care. And I'm going to stand on this and I'm going to die on this. I don't care what Eberflus does moving forward. If they win 10 games and squeak into the playoffs, I do not care. He's gone. There's no, the ceiling is done. The ceiling has been capped on this. It's got to happen. 
I don't care what he does moving forward. You go four and two in the division. You squeak in the playoffs. You win 11 games. I don't really care because if you're a basketball fan and you watch Mark Jackson take the Washington, uh, the Golden State Warriors to like two consecutive playoff runs, but they just felt that they were capped off by Mark Jackson and they saw an opportunity to get Steve Kerr. And as soon as they hired Steve Kerr, the ceiling rose. And then you see the Golden State Warriors just by better coaching. Didn't mean Mark Jackson was a bad coach. He wasn't. And he still had plenty of opportunities. He was well revered, well respected in the NBA. I'm an NBA head. Say what you know if these don't really match with you. But it you, they knew what their ceiling was and their cap was with Mark Jackson. They had a great year. They went to the playoffs. They saw the opportunity to upgrade, and they got rid of him. They got Steve Kerr, and guess what happened? You guys know the rest of the story. Washington no, 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 Golden State Warriors I'll, I'll to the Super, uh, champion. Lo- yeah. Lovey Smith was fired for a ten win season. He finished third in the division. So if that right. scenario is Carl- played out to a T this year. I would not be surprised. I w- what I'll say regarding the Eberflus situation, if you fire him, it might be the best move. A lot of you guys would say it's to take one step back, to take two steps forward. I think it's to take two steps back first, which is going to be unfortunate. And how much time can you waste with Caleb? If you're going to waste any time, it should be sooner rather than later. You're well, not taking I, steps I, back. No, I think not the not NFL, the modern NFL right now, especially with in terms of offense, I think we are done with that. I think we're done with first year coordinators being like, well, they just got together and they don't know how to read each other and what the playbooks are. A good offensive coordinator in these modern NFLs right now is simplifying playbooks, making concepts simpler, making uh, things more digestible. um, And they're, they're picking up and they're immediately taking off and improving. I'm just afraid of the personnel. You have a really good set of personnel, in my opinion. The back end secondary can be whatever you want, but I guess the front seven. If you but have Carl, to change from a four, Ben three Johnson's to a not three coming four, in here and trading Jalen Johnson. Yeah, you, well, and you're so not going to hire a coach that says, "I need a three four. Let's scrap everybody." You are still going to mix. It's it. possible. I it's, would hate it that. It is, but not likely. It's but highly, like, so highly. Why are you likely. crediting Matt Eberflus? Like, no, you got to credit because the players. The players just aren't going to Redskins to twelve legitimate points, and if Tyreek the... Stevenson didn't tell the fans to suck his dick, we're celebrating a, a victory Monday. A better coach would have t- thrown a timeout and told him what the fuck are you doing. A better coach, so, this so game like... should have been one twenty-eight to twelve. So listen, uh, Carl, well, I made this analogy. That falls on Caleb Williams. I've said so. I, I oh, made this analogy no. on your show. Mm-hmm. I made this analogy on your show, Carl. Only Super Bowl winning team to move on from their quarterback is the Ravens with Trent Dilfer. You win a Super Bowl and you still point to that guy and go, there's an upgrade Weakling. there. Like the balls it takes. It, it, like, and I told you, what it takes is a real a legendary head coach. To it took a real head coach to make that move. What the 49ers did with Trey Lance moving on from him after they gave up so much capital. It, it takes somebody who knows what they're seeing. And understands that their talent evaluation is correct. And so they're going to act on it. At the end of the day, it still is what it is. Like at the end of the day, you're still seeing what you're seeing. And so regardless of the results here, I think you're still seeing what you're seeing out of this coaching staff. And there's still clearly a lot of room for improvement here. And that's, that's what I mean. You go off and get another coaching staff. I don't think you're taking a step back. I'm gonna, I really I don't. don't. I can I see why you would. What I'm, when Paulie and I talked about the hiring of Matt Eberflus, and I said, Paulie, this type of shit gets really old really fast, and especially if it stops working. The hits principle, the, the loafs, the whatever. What happens when you are the guy given loafs and you don't give yourself loafs? All of your shit is bullshit. So this kind of stuff, and I, I would say this is, Happened since at midway last year. We're not talking about a small sample size of lack of accountability of Matt Eberflus. When Pauly talks about Yurko saying like sometimes it's just hat on a hat. It's a sport of a, a guy being stronger and bigger than another guy. When football people come in and they start thinking they're the smartest guy in the room, it almost never works out unless they're quiet about it. And then you get a Sean McVay. Matt Eberflus has absolutely announced every step of the way whether it's through play calling or just what he says at press conferences, I'm smarter than everybody else. And I don't need to be told anything otherwise. And so that guy, I can't stand that shit on the zero accountability. The second part of kind of piggybacking. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. It's it's our players that are the problem. Like you went off and built a very talented roster and then supplemented it with a first overall pick quarterback. Um, I do think Kingsbury properly helped 
game plan against Caleb. I think that's something that not a lot of people talk about. I think that is a huge factor in that type of matchup in the game script. Yeah, make sure you guys have this video monetized. And if uh, anyone course. starts on ESPN, whatever, they say, oh, Cliff Kingsbury is how they shut down Caleb Williams. That, that's credit Dave Ski. The, the how bad it is in that two weeks of game planning and how whether or not Jaden Daniels is ever even a question, which I, I watching that game plan, I don't think he was ever questionable. I think it was a uh, it was a Matt Eberflus esque uh, gamesmanship thing. You don't know if he's going to be there. You're going to game plan for Mariota. You got a plan game plan for Jaden. You got a game to plan be for fair both. to Jaden Daniels in the post game. He said, I didn't even think that I would be on this field if it wasn't for the grace of God or whatever his words were. So I do yeah, think that he was all. Questionable. I mean, it's whatever. Yeah, right. And, 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 and then David may have hit the nail clean through one swipe. David, yeah, the, uh, Matt the, 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 the grace of God, a tore shot in the fucking ribs. Right. What are you talking about? David, um, Matt Eberflus also said that their game planning, despite the quarterback, was the same. Right, yeah. it's a, 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 a similar Because he's player. stupid.